So my name is Karen Black, and I started, gosh, with NASA over 20 years ago. And back in the 2004 time frame, I was actually working in the Service Life Extension Program, which was the objective to actually extend the shuttle program for another about 10 to 15 years out to 2020. So at that time, we got the announcement for the vision of space exploration, which actually kind of countered the extension program, and it was the announcement that we would be ending the shuttle program by 2010. So for the most part, the Shuttle Life Extension Program core team of about 10 people transitioned pretty immediately into looking at how do we do the advanced planning for a close down of the program. So that was a pretty significant turn in the program's objectives and goals. So we spent about the first two years trying to codify what did that mean. So from that, I spent as a business manager in that activity for about the next three years, and I'm currently now moved on, and I am one of the division managers within the commercial crew program now looking at how we return our commercial or our astronauts to the space station on a commercial space vehicle. As far as roles and responsibilities, as we transitioned into the closeout of the shuttle program, what we had to focus on is how do we stand up a key organization? And so one of the first things that was done under Robert Lightfoot, at the time he was the assistant associate administrator for the shuttle program, so he looked at how do we develop a core team of individuals to help mature this activity and how we go about closing down a program. In fact, it's really never been done in the agency before. What we coined at that time as a graceful shutdown of a major spaceflight program, this was the first time it had ever been done that we were actually concurrently flying out a program at the same time we were planning and executing the close down of a program. So the roles and responsibilities kind of evolved through time. Initially he started out with a key group of about eight individuals. Mr. Lightfoot looked at a cross-functional uh, organization, so he pulled on expert from human capital, property, engineering, so we needed to make sure we understood the risk that we might be inducing to the flyout of the program by actually planning the close down and also the business area. So that's where I came in, in terms of the, the business function. So the other thing was Mr. Lee Norbrotten at the time was the manager of the Service Life Extension Program. So he also trans transitioned over as a principal in the uh, closeout, in the management of the closeout of the program. So early on, these roles and responsibilities were established to keep it small, kind of define what did it mean to close out the program, and then as we defined that, then we expanded the group. One of the principal things that we did was to include some transition managers from each of the space flight elements. So that enabled us to leverage uh, those individuals who had a direct line back to their project managers within their respective elements. As they were flying out the program, the transition managers were, for, were responsible for ensuring that we understood, we were aware of the flyout priorities at the same time that we managed this close down in parallel. So they were our interface back to the operational side of the program. It allowed kind of a mirror organization that could operate almost independently from the flyout program. But at the same time, we had the ability and the interface to understand, you know, the risks that we might be inducing on the program and likewise to allow us to continue to move through that but not directly impact the program. So another area that I consider a pretty significant lesson learned was in the area of also roles and responsibilities. As I said, we had about eight to ten people, core team early on, and you know, you get this huge initiative and the first thing that you feel like as a group of people is we need to understand what we have to do. And it was a significant amount of work when you talk about 18 to 20,000 people across the United States that were going to be impacted by this close down. When you talk about property, over a million piece line items of property, uh, facilities, infrastructure. So pretty broad reaching. And so initially we had this just overwhelming feeling like we have to define this. We have to figure it out. So eight to 10 people with this feeling of we're responsible for this. It took us about six months and some painful lessons, but the lesson learned, I would say, was understand what you need to accomplish, but then benchmarking, the importance of benchmarking, really going out and understand what's been done before and how you can leverage some of those lessons learned. But the second really important piece is realizing that you don't have to do it all yourself. So about six months into it, we started to realize, hey, there are experts out there. And I think it's a NASA kind of shuttle culture that we, we manage the program, so we want to do it ourselves. But realizing 
there were many um, experts out there um, that we were able to leverage their knowledge that they already had, for example, in property, environmental. So looking back, it seems like, you know, pretty, that should have been a no-brainer going in, but it wasn't at the time. We didn't understand who those experts were. You don't know what you don't know. So I would say a major lesson learned is really looking at what do we need to do and then who can help us? How can we leverage those experts with the, really within the agency and even outside? One good example is um, a function I never heard of called the State Historical Preservation Officer. All 50 states have one. And they are responsible for helping to find national landmarks, what constitutes an artifact and things like that. So they, by leveraging that expertise within each of the states, predominantly where we had shuttle infrastructure and uh, major flight assets, they were able to help us to find that and then what needs to happen as a result. So as we started to understand who those experts were, we were able to collaborate with them and leverage their expertise. And so we built that into our process. So rather than having to fight kind of align our you know processes to fit into those by helping them define using them to help define our processes that really was effective in terms of leveraging those skills and as we went forward then for decisions inside the agency and even outside by having those experts aligned with us it just built the credibility of our planning and our overall execution so definitely a major lesson learned So one of the first things that we did as we were trying to define the architecture for the closeout of the program was to assess how do we want to capture the overall planning and then execution of the program. And within the NASA nomenclature and architecture, one of the most common uses is the WBS. Work breakdown structure can be technical, it can also be financial. So we spent a, a significant amount of time with agency stakeholders trying to define upfront what level of detail do we need to go to in terms of the financial WBS, how do we align it with the constraints within the agency budget structure, and also allow the flexibility that we need. Again, we didn't want to be overly cumbersome in the way that we captured the cost, but we knew that this was going to be a highly visible activity within the agency and also literally within the government since it had not been done before. So early on, we determined we really need to define the architecture. The financial WBS helped us do that because once we had that, it went actually all the way to the agency. I think the administrator actually ruled on that financial WBS as it ultimately got rolled out. And that became really the backbone of our planning, of the way that we managed the program, and even the way that we captured the technical work, the schedule, everything. So it helped us to early on set the structure, and then we used that to help to advise, really manage expectations, what they wanted to see, when they expected to see it, and to budget and plan for activity, but then also to uh, manage the work as we executed and ultimately to be held accountable. So it really did help. I'd say it was one of our lessons learned. The earlier you can codify that architecture, the better off you are because as you work, march through time and you depart, make changes or, you know, that reality plays out different as we know than any plan. So as, as you're able to actually have that baseline codified as you move through time, you're able to then just capture the changes to that baseline and then quantify the impact. So it really helped us to kind of message our performance both in expectations and actual metrics as we worked through the closeout of the program. So as far as the early TNR transition and retirement uh, planning effort, uh, we had some initial activity to say how do we do this when we have concurrently the flyout of a major space flight program and we have the planning and ultimate execution of the shutdown of the program happening in parallel. So early on, we defined a process, Mr. Lightfoot was instrumental in this, where we did a mere organization process in terms of board, independent board structure, much like the program requirements control board on the operational side of the program, we had a transition PRCB. And its function was also to make those decisions bring those um, you know, trade space discussions that we needed to have addressed for closeout would go to the TPRCB, which was equivalent in authority as the flyout um, requirements control board, but Mr. Lightfoot chaired it. And so through that 
uh, board, we could make decisions on close out um, program decisions and then we would elevate those if need be. So there was an in interesting kind of tension going on because you have fly out and then you have close out of a program. So this independent but equivalent board structure allowed where there were decisions that would not impact fly out, we could take them to the TPRCB. Where there were decisions that actually had risk, a lot of them do if you make a decision to let go of a capability, it has some at least latent risk to the fly out of the program. So you could take it to the TPRCB and then it would be elevated to the program control board. And then ultimately, what was really important in the structure was the recognition that everything that we were making decisions on did not just impact shuttle. These are agency assets agency capabilities. So as we were closing down the shuttle program, the vision for space exploration actually enabled the Constellation program at the time. So we had Constellation program, we had Space Station, which was uh, dependent upon the shuttle for its positioning of its, its uh, long-term spares and things like that. So a lot of the decisions that we were making in terms of letting go capabilities were much broader than the shuttle program. So the structure, the early on planning by establishing the TPRCB, which then could be elevated to a transition control board at the agency level, that was a decision making body that had the determination or adjudication over assets and capabilities that cross cut. So if it was a, say, a facility at KSC, Kennedy Space Center, that was owned and managed by the shuttle program today, but it's going to be needed later, presumably by the Constellation program. So it would go to the Transition Control Board for awareness, for discussion, and then adjudication on do we maintain that facility, do we abandon it, mothball it, you know, and a lot of those determinations were made on when do we think we'll need it and what's the cost to maintain it versus the cost to just abandon it and turn around and use a different facility. So again, there was a lot of discussion on how do we capture those decisions because there was significant amount of information that went into making those determinations. As you can imagine, you have a lot of stakeholders that are best, you have a vested interest in the outcome. So what we ended up doing is developing a document called a SMART document. Ironically enough, it was the Shuttle Management Transition Resource, Shuttle Management Resource tr uh, Transition document. And that captured all of the pertinent information that was needed by decision makers ultimately to make that determination on letting a capability go. So that ended up being very vital in this process. So we had the, the early on planning and then we developed this document to capture all the information and that was basically the cornerstone document that was used in those review boards for determination ultimately to um, adjudicate what we were to do with those capabilities and facilities as they closed out. So as far as a lesson learned, and particularly as it relates to the SMART document that I just mentioned, it was a very vital document. Um, as I mentioned, we had um, fly out of the shuttle program going on at the same time that we we're planning close out, and we also had the development of this new Constellation program. So you can imagine there was a lot of tension within the agency decision-making structure in terms of timing, when we were comfortable with letting a capability go, and the other thing I really need to mention is early on in the vision for space exploration, it was not bipartisan support. So yes, the administration had announced it, but we did not have full stakeholder community support to closing down the shuttle program. So this caused a lot of, I'd say, angst in the system, um, decision delays, because when you're making a decision to eliminate a capability or to allow it to basically go away, that induces significant risk on the fly out of the program and also potentially on new and burgeoning programs as they come on and their need for that same capability. So the SMART document tried to capture what the opportunity costs were. If we make the decision today and we allow that capability to go away, what's the cost avoidance that we can save, but at the same time what's the potential risk to other programs and projects. So. It was a very, I'd say, pivotal document to help stakeholders to really kind of turn that emotional discussion because these capabilities have been around, you know, 30 years and it's hard for people who have lived their life in the shuttle program to let go of these capabilities and know we may never have them again as an as a agency. Many of them we may not need again, but that determination was emotional. So 
The SMART document allowed us to move that emotional discussion into a documented and a quantified opportunity cost discussion. So it was really uh, instrumental in helping us to move that discussion along. Really, I'd say from 2005, 2006 when we developed the SMART document, up until really 2008, even though we had the document now and we're starting to move them through the, session, the, the decision process, we still had a lot of delays because what we found was people didn't want to make a decision. You know, you don't want to sign to the bottom line when you're going to be held accountable for letting a capability go if later it's determined we really needed that capability. So the SMART document kind of forced that hand, um, the decision makers to, you know, play that trade space out and make a determination. So early on, the first few uh, SMART documents took up to about 18 months to two years to actually make it all the way through the agency. Maybe that's okay, because at the same time, you know, the agency was dealing with, are we really going to close out the shuttle program? So again, it allowed the discussions to occur, though, and it informed the discussions. So by about the 2008 time frame, when we really did neck down that parallel path for continuing a program and shutting, out, shutting it down, at that point, then the SMART document really started to move through the process. And one good example early on was a vendor that we had within the, um, the RSRM program, the Solid Rocket Motors. Uh, this was a company that built the case forgings. So they did this by hand. There were really only two people that had, and it really wasn't a science, it was an art, and the way they forged these uh, huge casings for the Solid Rocket Motors. We had a, a smart document that came through to actually close down that capability, which meant to let these two people go. And it was a very emotional discussion, because do we need it? Are we going to need to make more casings? We had you know, a number in spares, but that determination was a challenging one. So that particular decision took about, I think, as I recall, about two years to get through the process. But the benefit was, by the time the SMART document went through all the state agency stakeholders, we knew that there was an informed decision made. Everybody was, you know, duly informed before that capability was let go. So it captured the capability, the discussion, the impact, and then it codified and documented the results. So when we let that capability go, there was no confusion or mystery later as to, you know, somebody not being notified. So it, did, it really did turn out to be a good uh, document. So one of the critical things in, in your early program planning is the assumptions that you apply to start off. And so within the shuttle transition retirement, early on we had this broad pronouncement at the you know, national level. As is usually the case, you don't get a lot of details behind what that means. And so early on we had the challenge of saying, okay, how do we go about doing it? And what are the assumptions that we want to apply initially for our planning efforts? So in some discussions with Mr. Gerstenmeier and um, the mission director at that time, early on the decision was we need to assume that we are going to have to disposition everything. We did not know what you know pieces of property out of 1.2 million line items of property. We didn't even know how much property we had at that time in terms of an integrated number like that. But how do you plan for that and how do you estimate the cost to do that? So initially as we went through that and we understood the scope the breadth of what we were dealing with, we did not know the end state. Where was it going to go? So the assumption going in was a very conservative assumption that said, if we have to disposition everything, if we have to get rid of all line items of property, if we have to handle this perturbation to the workforce, what that means, you know, thousands of people across the United States in terms of severance and retention liability, um, infrastructure, if we no longer need it and we don't have an assumption that other programs and projects are going to take it over, what does that mean? The cost to mothball and abandon infrastructure. Even items such as IT infrastructure, all the software, all the licenses that we have, having to disposition those, and also just the thousands and thousands of records that we have within the shuttle program. The cost to actually archive those records, go through them, disposition those. So you can imagine early on if you say we don't have any assumption for a takeover responsibility. It was a very conservative estimate. It, was, it came in at about $4 billion. It, it's what I consider the bounding case. 
was it ever going to cost that much? We knew the, that was an untenable amount to the agency, but what it enabled us to do is use that as, if that's the bounding cost, if we don't have anybody come in and take over some of this uh, activity, and if we don't have any ability to change our processes that we use today, that that's the magnitude of the impact. So what it did allow us to do is start to use that as our negotiation back. So it informs stakeholders, if we don't get some of these waivers, like on bulk property disposition and things like that, even some of the environmental discussions on, on uh, what our liability is, responsibility going forward, it doesn't change the liability, but how you manage that and how you mitigate it and our ability to actually talk with these different stakeholders again and get uh, their engagement on trying to mitigate the impact. Also, uh, it really helped to inform Mr. Gerstemeyer and some of the discussions with other programs and projects in terms of well, when are they going to need the capabilities, how do we try to kind of not mothball them to take them to a low level state until they need them operationally. So it really served as a point of departure in my mind. And I think the major lesson learned there is you don't know what you don't know. You don't know how it's going to play out. But by defining what we use as our assumptions early on and then, again, documenting those assumptions as we marched through time and we executed the program, what we were able to do is actually quantify. We were able to document the changes, and as we moved away from those original conservative assumptions, we could then quantify the impact in terms of cost savings or cost avoidance. So it really informed the discussion, and it I would say it motivated the agency to really say, okay, we need to look at other ways of doing this business to close out. So the combination of those things helped us to actually move this to where at the end, in the end, it cost less than a billion dollars for the closeout, I believe. I ha actually wasn't involved at the end, but I believe it was less than a billion dollars in the end. So again, not the right number to start with, but what it did allow us to do is use that as our point of departure and inform the discussions and really to, uh, I would say, motivate timely decisions so we were able to avoid more costs in the long run. So we recognize that the space shuttle program and, the, of course, the space station program were joined together, you know, inextricably linked. So the close down of the shuttle program and the impact of space station, I think we could not have even imagined the magnitude of that impact. So they did identify the shuttle transition retirement budget within the space station, which was the impact to them of the shuttle going away. It was a lot of the prepositioning of their major um, LRU replacement units, um, a lot of their logistics that they had planned on taking up as they needed them, they now needed to what they called preposition them on their uh, logistics modules in order to have them available once the shuttle could no longer um, taxi those items back and forth. So I would say a lesson learned again here is the communication early in terms of understanding across these programs, the impact uh, dependent upon each one of these programs and then trying to quantify that. One of the challenges we had with Constellation and Space Station, we were all independently estimating what it was going to cost, what was the impact. But when we got to the point of trying to integrate these cost impacts or the risk, trying to quantify the risk, it was very challenging, really because the assumptions behind them all differed. Um, many of our assumptions when we do our strategic planning are dictated from um, guidance that we get e either from headquarters or even outside the agency, OMB. So, Sometimes those directions aren't consistent across each one of the mission directorates, and even within a mission directorate, consistent with across the program. So that inconsistency was really a challenge then on trying to integrate the cost impact and overall magnitude of shuttle closeout. So I think a lesson learned there is taking a step back when you have a significant change in strategic direction and saying what is the mutual impact across all of these uh, elements within the enterprise and understanding the overall uh, impact and then the ability to quantify that better and be consistent in our planning and the um, ultimate impact to the agency. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the key operational assumptions behind the transition and closeout. I mentioned earlier the discussion about the process which included the transition program control board and then the uh, tr transition control board at the agency level and how those mirrored really operational program and those decision boards. 
But as we elevated up to the transition control board, it allowed that cross-cutting uh, determination of the impact across programs. So as we went through the execution of the program and ultimately as we got closer to the end of the program, we actually converged those control boards back into the operational program again too because they really were at that point, there was no decision that was made on operations or on closeout that did not impact one another. By the time we got to about the 2009 time frame, they really were inextricably linked. So those got dovetailed back in together and I think that was a benefit. So early on it allowed us to do this uh, in parallel, but as we closed toward the end of the program, we dovetailed them back in together and I think that was an effective way to do that. One of the other challenges that we had though in the operations of the uh, close out of the program was how we had a lot of stakeholders within the agency, very different than traditional flyout stakeholders. You have the same mission assurance and your technical authorities, but we also had uh, experts and stakeholders like environmental and institutional stakeholders that wanted to understand, again, what are the impacts to the states, you know, the facility closeout, what's the impact to the construction of facilities budget. So we had a lot of other I'd say vested um, stakeholders that were above and beyond our traditional interfaces with our operational partners. So one of the challenges we had early on is those stakeholders had vested interest in sometimes accelerating decisions, sometimes delaying decisions. And so as a core TNR community, we had a challenge on how do we address those, you know, take on those questions and those requests, but at the same time, how do we keep everybody mutually informed? And if you accelerate something for one stakeholder, what's the impact to other stakeholders? So we developed what was called a transition action plan around the 2007 timeframe. It was a tactical program which was milestone driven. Uh, it was really mostly a one to two page document. Uh, it had key decisions and milestones, but it was done almost in swim lanes for each of the functional areas. So you had like human capital decisions. We had property decisions when we were going to let major pieces of property go. We had major, um, what we called key decision dates for our flight, major flight assets when we were going to make a determination and they would go away too. So the transition action plan, affectionately called the TAP, was used to manage those decisions and when we got these questions or requests coming in from vested stakeholders, we could look at that respective swim lane, determine the impact of that function, but what it allowed us to do is also look vertically across the schedule and say, not only is this going to help, maybe help that uh, area, that functional area by accelerating a decision, but it enabled us to look vertically to say what's the impact to the other functions, because we recognize that you can't make any of these decisions independently. So it gave us the kind of the document and the, the um, the information to really have again that informed decision. So you weren't making a decision to accelerate a property decision not realizing that it was going to impact workforce and now we hadn't planned for the workforce perturbation. So that uh, TAP became very effective. We took it all the way to the agency again. It went to, in fact I think uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer used it outside the agency, but it really became kind of our, our um, tactical playbook and we used that to establish expectations with our stakeholders and then also to manage our day-to-day our, um, -day operations, really month-to-month -month operations. And then the third benefit of the TAP was it, it allowed us to be accountable. And most importantly is to show progress. Or if we weren't able to make progress, we were able to document why and be held accountable for that. So I would say that was also a very beneficial document in actually executing the program. One of the most vital areas for the transition and close out of the program, which cannot be overstated, was communication. And we know communication is fundamental to everything we do, but in the area of transition and retirement, communication was key early on to just, again, understand who are the stakeholders, what do they expect, and then how do we communicate our, our progress as we move through this. So. We did some early benchmarking again to understand what's been used in the past to communicate. Um, you usually find out that people like to hear things a number of different ways and so we definitely found out in the transition and retirement that there were a number of ways that in surveying and doing focus groups that people wanted to hear progress and at the end of the day they want to know what does that close out of the program mean to me. Many of these people have worked for the shuttle program for 20 to 30 years, and so it's not just a programmatic decision, 
It's a personal, personal decision and it's a personal impact. So through our dialogue and focus groups, we found out that they want to hear it through written information. They want to hear it through, some people want to hear it from my supervisor in a one-on-one. -on -one. Some people want to get it in an email. Other people wanted to hear it in town hall meetings. So it became very clear to us that it's not one size fits all. So one of the things we did was establish what were called talking points. Another key component of communication, consistency. So it wasn't so important to have all the answers, which we didn't have many of the answers early on, but it was much more important to be consistent in our messaging. So employees were okay if we said, I don't know the impact yet, but employees were not okay if supervisor A told them one thing and then they went to a meeting and heard another thing, as none of us would be. So when the message isn't consistent, it causes more um, upset within the workforce. And so the talking points were actually distributed on a monthly basis and they went to all the center directors and they were handed out to supervisors who were actually responsible for communicating that information directly to the workforce. In addition to that, we had such things as a blog where people could write in questions. Some people prefer social media type uh, interface. We had a rendezvous magazine, which was very informative in terms of progress and that was focused on what people wanted to hear. So again, we kind of had this closed loop communication, focus groups telling us what, it, what they want to hear, what their concerns were, and then we use these different media uh, formats to distribute that information back. So I'd say that was a good lesson learned. And then the other thing with communication early on that we did within the transition management plan, which was our playbook. I don't think I've mentioned yet, but early on, we had no playbook. You know, we did benchmarking, but we did not have something to go to to say, here's your script, here's your procedures. NASA loves procedures. But in terms of closing down a program, it had never been done like that before. Uh, like that meaning a orderly shutdown of a program. So we realized early on, we have to define something. So the transition management plan was our playbook. And I would add that that was also really significant best practice, lesson learned that did we know everything early on? We didn't. But what we knew, we captured in our plan, and what we didn't, we planned anyway. And what, again, what it allowed us to do was use this as our playbook, have it guide our decisions, but at the same time, have it be adaptable. So as reality plays out different, we were, <clears throat> we were adjusting the transition management plan accordingly. So in that management plan, we had a communication section, which identified all the interface points. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that was one of our lessons learned. As we understood better with those interface points, we updated the transition management plan to capture those. So it kind of defined how do we talk to different stakeholders, what information do they need, and how do we communicate that on a regular and consistent basis. So in terms of the top three takeaways that I would have from a business perspective for shuttle transition and retirement, I'd say the first one was Mr. Lightfoot recognized early on the significance of the business acumen within the decision-making process and the structure that that would bring by bringing in the business determination on the functional WBS, how we would do the financial WBS, how that helped to basically prescribe the architecture under which we conducted the transition and close out. So he really used the business function to help define that. As we architected that, then we used that to develop many of our formats that we use for communicating and reporting our, our metrics. So I would say early on, understanding and codifying that WBS, whatever the architecture is you decide to use, by codifying that early, using that again, that starts to establish how you manage and report expectations to stakeholders, and then it allows you to help manage what they want later in terms of information, level of detail. By having that established early, you can use that as always, again, re reiterating, this is the level of detail we have. We established it earlier. So we were able to, to leverage that and keep that consistency all the way through the closeout of the program. So my second key takeaway is really recognize it early. You have to understand the scope. You want to struggle with what is the scope of what we're trying to accomplish. But once you have that scoped out, is to really recognize you don't have to do it all yourselves. You know, benchmarking, really going out and saying who's done this before and how did they approach it, what worked for them, what did not work for them. 
And secondly, really looking to say, are there experts out there? You know, again, addressing the, you don't know what you don't know. So looking to say, take a moment to say, are there experts within the community of practice who already understand some of these areas? And leveraging them, build your processes to actually take the advantage of those stakeholders and those experts and use them to help define how you want to go execute this activity. So you don't have to do it all yourself. So understanding the sooner you can recognize that and build that into your process and leverage those experts, the better off that you'll be in the long run. So the third and final takeaway I would say from my experience in TNR is it's almost the opposite or the inverse balance of the second one, which is you can't wait to have it defined for you. So in lieu of a playbook, develop your own playbook. Understand, again, once you know the scope, let's talk about what we have to accomplish, the timeline we have to accomplish it in, and let's develop the plays in order to get there. Recognizing that it's adaptable as you go through there. So you can't wait that decision paralysis of waiting for decisions to be made. The playbook will enable you to actually move, make progress, and good timely progress, and then adapt it as you go. So you leverage it and then you adjust it as need be when you have new players come in, new experts come in, or new, you know, new um, requirements are developed or changes in the agency direction. So it allows you to adjust those as you go, and I mention it several times, but the real benefit of that is, A, it keeps you moving, and B, as reality departs from that initial plan, that playbook is kind of a, a running dialogue of what occurred, and so it helps you to document the impact, the changes and the impact over time. And so from a lessons learned and a look back, you can have a lot more to gain if you keep this dynamic playbook as you go rather than waiting for people to define it for you.